My family had searched for laser all those years. Towards the end, they were pretty convinced that there was no way he could be alive. I was interested to know um, how he died, when exactly he died, whether, whether whatever they'd thought about it um, was in fact closer to the truth. It was an important activity for me because what it finally achieved was that it gave closure to a question that was perhaps not answered fully until I saw in black and white the circumstances of, of his death. But I think also that until you confirm it finally, you keep a sliver of hope. And um, perhaps it is better ultimately to know exactly what happened because then you can then you can move on. And I think of them, his brothers and his mother, never really being able fully to move on. Not expecting to get him back, but perhaps keeping a space for that. What they thought had happened, in fact, had actually happened. So they must have had inklings over the years, or there must have been some um, uh, they, they must have got some news of what had happened or they did have some expectation because when I finally heard the truth, when I finally got the documents, when I finally saw how it had happened, it was not in fact that different to what they thought had happened. The difference was that they kept a shred of hope that perhaps he might be alive. I always knew him as Pinky. It was Pinky and Morris were the two brothers who left, went back to Russia. I have a family photograph up there which doesn't include the, those two brothers. So when I was about six weeks old, they were gone already. As far as I can recollect, uh, what became of my uncles, the disappearance, the whole thing was never discussed. We heard nothing, we knew nothing. Uh, perhaps my parents and grandparents actually found out something, but I, I never knew. I'm only finding out 60 odd years later. My father once read a book uh, called The Jungle. It was written by Upton Sinclair. And he was also a member of this uh, Johannesburg Public Library. And uh, after he had read this book, his ideology changed a lot. Because this book wrote about the um, slaughterhouse were people living in bad conditions and uh, he thought of becoming a communist. So he, together with a friend of his, Mr. Bunting, they organized the first communist party in Johannesburg and they issued a newspaper, the communist newspaper, and uh, I used to drop in there from time to time and help them sought the newspaper to the subscribers. Well, for that they gave me a couple of pennies for my little job. In 1922, my father uh, was arrested. The policeman came into our uh, house where we were living in Simmons Street, searched our flat, looked for pamphlets, concerning communist uh, ideology or anything about communism. And one of the policemen saw on the wall a frame with the picture of a hammer and sickle. 
This uh, policeman took down the frame and broke it over the head of my father. My father was taken away, arrested, and 10 days later he came back home. Jimmy Laguma uh, went to a conference of the League Against Imperialism in Brussels and it was there that the first time that this Black Republic resolution came about, the idea that the South African Communist Party should set its, as its goal uh, the, the establishment of a Black Republic in South Africa. It said the independent Black Republic will be a stage towards a Workers' and Peasants' Republic. A and thereafter, Laguma went to Moscow and he ha held discussions with people in the Communist International uh, and as a result, a draft resolution on this question was sent to South Africa and it provoked a lot of discussion. After that, a lot of troubles, internal scuffles, if this is the proper word, started inside the Communist Party. Some people opposed it because they did not want to see black majority rule in South Africa. But there was another kind of opposition that, that came up uh, to this resolution. That was led by Sidney Bunting and he thought that this diluted um, the, the, the nature of the struggle. In the 1929 to 1933 period it became interpreted in an ultra-left way by Douglas Walton and Bach. In 1931 the, uh, Sidney Bunting was expelled from the Communist Party um, and and he was expelled by Walton. They left a very deep wound, I would say, in the history of the revolution movement there by the culture of intolerance, by introducing the culture of intoler intolerance, expelling each other, etc. In 1935, Moses Kotani, who had been back in the country from Moscow for about two years, uh, engaged in a big struggle with Lazarbach in which he essentially wanted to, if you like, um, impose a united front strategy rather than the ultra-leftism of Lazarbach. Moses Kotane, as you remember, in 1934, in February, sent such a letter to his colleagues that uh, we have our own problems, not problems how to fight against uh, Trotskyism. For 11 years, I was correspondent of his Vestia newspaper in southern and eastern Africa, based in Maputo. I was the first uh, Soviet correspondent who interviewed Comrade Mandela after he came uh, out of the prison. And when I returned to Moscow, and I returned in 91, uh, I was uh, thinking of this experience, and therefore, when uh, the opportunity uh, opened to study the unknown history of South Africa, uh, I came to the archive, former archive of um, Marx, Engels, Lenin, Stalin, or uh, it was renamed, and I started to study Comintern protocols. From the history we know that in the 30s and 40s, uh, Comintern, uh, under the guidance of Stalin personally, under the guidance of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, uh, was the brain trust of all communist activity abroad. I uh, follow the drama that happened with these people, and I felt the atmosphere of fear, of uh, uh, despair of the people who were devoted all their lives to communism and could not understand how can it happen that they were imprisoned by the people whom they thought to be uh, communist and avant-garde of the mankind. After my study in archives, I prepared a story that was published in Izvestia in February 93. The title is From Africa to Gulag on the recommendation of Comintern. And uh, from the officials of uh, archives, I received 
photos from the case, photos of two brothers, Richter and Comrade Bach. Story that I wrote one year before, it was in May 92, about the Comintern activity, about the internal struggle of uh, different sections of Comintern, including uh, South Africans. The Sunday Times article, which appeared in 1993, uh, was certainly pivotal in making my decision to go because I think then for the first time I realized the archives were open, I would be able to access the material, I would finally know when, where and how he died was nearest that that would be possible. That was a very important um, milestone. I wasn't quite sure what to make of the article. It was clearly, uh, it had sensationalist aspects to it. They were clearly trying to emphasize the factionalism and the fighting that had gone on within the Communist Party of South Africa at that stage. But nonetheless, they had looked at the files, and I knew that there was a file, and in fact, even in that article, the numbers of the files were given, which later turned out to, to be not the numbers on the files that I had accessed. Looking through the documents, the public records, uh, which were housed in Kew, under the British Foreign Office files, I do have a recollection of several letters which were written by the British representative in Moscow at the time to the Foreign um, to the foreign ministry, I think the person's name was Weinberg, requesting um, either to have access to or further information about certain people being held in prison camps, in prison or in labor camps by the Soviet Union. Um, Laser was definitely one of these, but the papers pertaining to his particular case were missing. There were several others as well, including the Richters and uh, they met with no success at all. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Moscow was absolutely intransigent about these people being Russian citizens and Britain having absolutely no jurisdiction over what happened to them at all. Leyser and the Richters had returned to Moscow from South Africa in 1935. It had taken two years for them to be sentenced and sent to the labor camps. And during that period, Paul Richter had um, met up with and established a relationship with a young woman, a doctor, actually Ludmilla, and they'd had a child whom they named Vilain. I very badly wanted to meet Vilain because I thought it was so extraordinary. I felt firstly that I had a brother in history, um, that he was involved in the same set of historical circumstances that my family had been, although I never knew him um, they'd probably been held in one cell. They certainly had known each other very well. And 65 years later, I had come across this person purely by chance. I contacted one of the sources who, in fact, was to prove um, an invaluable source, Svetlana. Svetlana had this brilliant idea, which was so simple that we hadn't thought about it first. And what she did, very good records are kept in Moscow, probably in the whole of the Soviet Union. She went to the, we knew which year he'd been born, we knew his name, and she went through the birth records in the National Registry of Births for that year. And there was his name, he was registered. There was a telephone number listed. She phoned the number and he answered the phone. So then I Can you say you are Judith. Radak. Radak Kunitsa. Hello. 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 Yes. She wants to describe her impression of Lazar when she saw him. Yes. He was very elegant. Elegant man. Very pleasant. Very sociable. He worked much with people, she says. He met many people. And that's why he could establish a contact. And he was interested in it. 
воспоминания 60-летней давности. Она очень сожалеет, что причиняет вам такие... Нет, ну что же, ну что же, это, это возврат к прошлому. Конечно, это очень печально, что столько людей погибло зря. In 1930, my father decided to leave for Russia, for the Soviet Union. Because after all, as he was on the blacklist, uh, the uh, Ministry of Defense told people that they shouldn't come to our store to buy fried fish and chips because he's a communist. And people have their own ideas about communism. So, Things became slack, so he decided to leave for the USSR. And uh, he asked me, would I like to come along with him? Well, I was a little kid there, not a little kid, I was 16 years old. So I said, yes, Pa. For me, it was a kind of adventure. We left for Warsaw and got on a train that took us all the way to Russia. But before arriving in, uh, in uh, Moscow, my father was very much interested in the state of Stalin. He read an article in the Polish newspaper that Stalin was very sick. And he wanted to know from the passengers who were, live, who were uh, traveling together with us, how does Stalin feel? How is he? Is he in a better state than what he was, all the passengers kept quiet. When we arrived at the border of Warsaw and uh, Russia, my father was detained and taken to the, to, to the custom house. There he had to declare how much money he had, what has he in his suitcase, and uh, he had to make a decla declaration. When, we, when he came back to the train, I was waiting for him in the wagon of the train, and he was very much disappointed. I asked him why, what's the matter? He says, well, he didn't like the way the people treated him at the custom house. My father was arrested on the 17th of March, 1935. Uh, the reason for his arrest, I don't know and will never know because in his file it was not mentioned at all. During the time that my father was in the camp, we heard nothing at all about him. In fact, he had no rights to write to us. And uh, he could not inform of his whereabouts. But I accidentally found out, found out that he was sent to a place called Patma, south of Moscow. And that's all I knew about his fate. Of course, many years have passed already since he was arrested. Most likely, he was either shot, most likely he died of hunger there. We don't know. Nothing at all of his fate. The influence of Comintern on the South African movement was, was controversial. You see. On one side, it helped a lot in developing contacts between the South African revolutionaries and revolutionaries of other countries. At the same time, what you described as prescriptions of, of, of Comintern uh, often did not take into account the real situation, the details of the situation in the country. Communist Party in South Africa was practically destroyed by Comintern to the middle of the 30s. And the Communist Party was, I don't remember exactly, but I suppose that in the middle of the 30s, South Africa had only 
maybe 100, maybe 110 members of the Communist Party. That's all at that time. There were two sections. In one section, uh, Laserbach and uh, almost all people from Politburo. And among them, Mofut Sanyan and G.B. Marx and many others um, who supported Moscow uh, tactics, strategy. And other section uh, with Moses Kotane. Both the, these sections sent letters to Moscow. Uh, they asked Moscow, tell us please, who is right, we or other section? <coughs> And Moscow uh, invited representatives of both groups to come to Moscow. Firstly, invited, then ordered. But uh, only Laserbach came and one of Richter brothers, Morris. They came to Moscow. It was, I suppose, beginning of 1935. Members of the party were invited to Moscow to come specifically to give evidence to the Marty Commission about the nature of their relationship with uh, the policy of the Communist International, with the Communist Party, uh, and their attitudes to different political issues uh, that were discussed in the party at that time. They had two sessions. I don't remember exactly, but I suppose that one session was maybe November 1935, next session was one year or maybe one year and a half later. They discussed South African situation, situation in the Communist Party of South Africa. And the result was that they blamed this slogan, Native Independent Republic, and uh, they ordered Laserbach and then to Maurice Richter to be students at Kutv University. In this uh, story, uh, I mentioned for the first time about Bach, who, according to the Marti uh, decision, was obliged to stay in Russia for a certain period to investigate his case. The only practical point was that Lazar would not return back. He would stay here. He was not expelled, as you know, in the beginning. And he stayed in Russia. He had no opportunity to leave Russia. And as we know, from uh, after tw uh, 35 came 37 year. The big repression started. In Comintern was a certain person who was very famous, his name was very famous in Russia. I remember as a young pioneer, uh, I also knew his name and he was, you see, when the demonstrations of 1st of May or 7th of November, the day of October revolution took place, he was standing on the Red Square like a big hero. His name was André Marti. He was emissar of Covintern in the Spain Civil War. He was a Frenchman, he was a sailor, and according to the history of Bolsheviks, he was um, uh, supporting uh, October Revolution, and then he started to be polit emigre. I am not his admirer, he was not good human being. Marty, a French communist, was uh, actually uh, head of the Anglo-American Secretariat, uh, and uh, this was one of uh, uh, the bodies that was responsible for the South African Communist Party uh, and uh, uh, for working out the policy of the South African Communist Party. So that, that is why he was appointed uh, head of this commission. And the last was the last meeting, they Гостиница, я забыла, как, какой-то гостиница советская, что ли. И была еще одна негритянка, прекрасная женщина, вот с ними вместе. Но она вскоре уехала, она. И наши, мы поехали туда, я с мальчиком поехала, поехали к ним туда вечером. И что-то они очень долго разговаривали, 
Я, а я качал себе мальчика в базал. А вот если мне придется уезжать, йога не сбок, ты поедешь со мной? Поеду. А ты знаешь, что там работать, может быть, тебе и не придется. Я говорю, ну не придется, так не придется. Ты меня прокормишь. Все. Вот такой был разговор. Да, и вечером я, они никак не могли расстаться. Я все время, и, ну пойдем домой, пойдем домой. Ребенок уже спит, я как, ну пойдем. Вот. И в, в этот вечер, когда мы пришли домой, в этот вечер его взяли. И вдруг, это был март 37 -го года, <coughs> ночью приходят, звонят, приходят, э, одевайтесь. Ну, не могу я сейчас это вспомнить. Это ужасно тяжело. Галстук у него висел на шее, не был завязан, не сказали, не завязан. И он меня увидел, оделся, выходит и говорит, ты знаешь, ты дарлинг, дарлинг, не, не, обе, не, не, не беспокойся, я ни в чем не виноват, я скоро буду. Это последние его слова. Но я больше его не видел. На другой день я позвонила по телефону в эту гостиницу узнать, я, и Мориса и, есть или нет, и Лаза есть или нет, сказали или нет. А эта негресенка уехала раньше намного, и поэтому, слава Богу, осталась она дома, а не здесь. Я узнала в тот самый момент, когда его взяли. В Москве уже были разговоры, и очень многие исчезали таким образом, приходили, брали и не возвращались они. I was working as a trolleybus driver in one of Moscow's mm, uh, routes. About two o'clock in the morning of this day that I came home from work, a knock at the door. Who can it be? Two o'clock in the morning. Well, I opened up the door and three people, all dressed in black, came in and said, you are Glazer? Came into our room and asked me, are you Glazer? I said, yes. You are Joseph Glazer? Yes. We have a warrant for your arrest. I said, there must be some kind of a mistake. They said, we never make any mistakes at all. Here is the warrant, and they pack up your goods, and you'll have to come along with us. We know perfectly well that you were slandering the Soviet Union. I said, I never did slander the Soviet Union at all. I came out from a South African country to your country to help your country, and you accuse me of slandering the USSR. They took me away on their car to Lubyanka. You know, Lisa Bach was sent to Gulag not because his activity in South Africa it was only maybe third or fifth point, but the first point uh, was their contacts with a person with such a name, Yurin, who was uh, arrested as Trotskyist. He was accused that he had concealed uh, his, his father's uh, uh, wealth. His father was uh, uh, owner of, of certain industries in Latvia and, and, and in South Africa, of a factory or several factories or something like that. And he was accused of the fact that he didn't uh, declare this. The situation that existed at that time was that uh, all the relatives, all the close friends of a particular accused were actually arrested and many of them executed. You didn't need to share somebody's views, you had just to meet a person. André Marti, it is his fault and his hands are in blood because he was writing uh, secret reports to Stalin about certain people 
uh, who in his opinion were not uh, real communists and also he wrote such report and after this Richter and Bach were convicted. The interrogator came in the morning and uh, told me that uh, you are an uh, enemy of the people. I said I am not an enemy of the people at all but Tomorrow I have to be at work. And he laughed at me and said, what kind of work? You'll be working for us now. You'll be sent out to the Far East, Magadan, Kalima. There you'll be working for us. But I said, it's, uh, it can't be so. I'm an honest man. He says, now that you are with us, you'll remain with us. And in 25 years later, you'll be freed. And so we, he began to interrogate me day after day, night after night. He threatened me with being sent to the uh, cellar down below where it's cold, where you have to, where I must think about my future, that I must tell them that what they would like me to say. After a nine months interrogation, I was told that I was given a 10 year sentence. And I had to undersign a paper stating that I read the, <coughs> uh, the statement and I had to undersign. And then I was sent back to the cellar. And when I when the door opened and I was shoved into the cellar once more, all the prisoners, political prisoners, asked me, how many years were you sentenced? I told them 10 years. Well, she said, that's right, because all the people in the cellar are sentenced to 10 years. And in a week's time, I believe it was, they, we were packed into a uh, cattle, car, and sent off to our destination. My destination was Karaganda. And they gave me the case, so-called case, uh, according to which both Richters were sentenced and sent to concentration camp. They were sent to uh, Dalny Vostok, Far East, and uh, in it was after 37 it was uh, 40 uh, the chief of the concentration camp sent a report to Moscow that a conspiracy was uh, disclosed and according to the conspiracy uh, more than 100 people were shot uh, on the place, including both Richters. You dealt with people who were, whose mind worked uh, at disclosing of uh, conspiracies. And if you want to find a conspiracy, you will find it anywhere. It could be just one uh, Ogepeu official who decided that uh, uh, he would get a promotion. And he accused these guys of participating in, uh, in such a conspiracy. Or there may have been a quarrel. Or they may have done something wrong, which this person interpreted as a conspiracy. Uh, they were imprisoned by, uh, you see, um, administrative authorities. And practically all this punishment was uh, achieved by administrative authority, not the courts. There were uh, organized so-called Troika, three people appointed by party people and tank over there, this is security uh, <coughs> committee, uh, were established everywhere in each region, in each city, small or big. So it was a three-man trial, three men decided your fate. You didn't see those three men at all. You weren't shown them and they didn't show up in front of you. Each Troika uh, was considering sometimes 
20, 100, 5, but every day a certain number of cases of such people. No advocates, nobody to defend me, and I was told that I was given a 10-year sentence. People who were imprisoned, especially foreigners, they were uh, ignorant of such system and they thought that, okay, they were beaten, they were tortured in Lubyanka <coughs> cells, but they thought that after they would uh, be brought to trial, they could say everything, how they were beaten and that their uh, confession was a false one. No. We were just signing that paper and off we were sent to 10 years in a gulag. And when uh, we arrived in Karaganda, the first thing we were taken to a camp, quarantine bank, a camp where we had to stay for a week or so. We were given our quarters down in the cellar, bed and nothing else. And in those beds there were thousands of bugs. Couldn't sleep the night at all. All you were doing is itching and itching and itching away. Early in the morning, uh, they woke us up and then we were told to go to the gates. There the soldiers checked us up five by five. First the five, first five went and behind the next five went and we were checked up by each uh, soldier. After being checked, the chief of the convoy yelled out, a step to the right, a step to the left, we count as an escape. And we have the rights to shoot and kill. Forward, march. And we will march to work. Ну вот, и я, конечно, я ходила под страхом смерти. Я, я не знала, что мне делать. Я взяла своего сына, завернула скорее, и мы с ним поехали к, к маме на Кубань. Я его спрятала туда, потому что было уже известно, что детей забирают или в детские дома, или кому-нибудь отдают какому-нибудь там ну, интересующемуся человеку, семье или человеку, не знаю для чего-то. Мне было страшно за своего сына. И вот, и в общем, я все время держала все в секрете. Я ни с кем не могла, даже близкие мои люди, близкие мои друзья, женщины, которые так ко мне относились постарше меня. Вообще меня всегда, всегда любили женщины, которые старше меня намного, на 10-15 лет. И вот я им никогда не говорила. Гарганда из километров. In Kazakhstan, this was a camp, Gulag. No matter what kind of work we worked at, we worked every single day, Saturday, Sunday, weather cold, hot, windy, snow falling, frosty. Every single day we worked. There was no holiday for us at all. And the working at the construction buildings was very difficult. I found it difficult because uh, I wasn't a very strong youngster then, but still they didn't take, take in, into account you're a strong convict, a strong political prisoner or not. You are a prisoner and that's all. You have to work all day long. All day long we only thought of one thing, bread. Bread, bread. Because the amount of bread they gave us uh, was about less than a pound. 
It was very difficult, of course, being hungry and working all day long. Coming home, there was one thought again in our heads. At least we'll have something hot given to us to eat. What uh, left an impression on me was the fact that if you simply couldn't fulfill your quota of work just because it was either unrealistic or because you weren't well uh, or because you were hungry, you, you simply got less and less to eat. No, what? Я получила два письма от своего Пауля с дороги. Он написал, что он едет в Колыму и опустил. Кто-то там помог ему попустить эти два письма мне. И больше я ни одного письма от него не получала. Кстати, я очень долго его берегла. И вот когда приехала мама, и она знала уже, уже что какая-то какая трагедия постигла нас. И нашла эти письма. Я, я, я потом я предполагала, поняла, что это сделала мама. Она боялась его почерк, знала. И она уничтожила эти письма. Она боялась за меня. I was deprived of all correspondence with anybody, not even with my wife. A whole year I could not correspond with her. I did not receive any letters at all. And I did write letters, I knew the address. I did write letters, but I gave them to a free man. Basically, the information I got was that he was very thin, he had not had enough to eat, and his food rations very much depended on how much work he was able to do. And there were constant complaints in the file that he was not doing his fair share of work. He was a hewer of wood. Um, it was winter, he died in March, it must have been just after a very cold winter, it was 1941. I think the survivors must have been very lucky, very strong, very healthy. Um, Laser was an intellectual, he was small, he was slight. Um, I don't think he had much of a chance. And I remember thinking that he'd lasted four years and that was probably quite a long time. I got the doctor's report, a, a rough transcription of the doctor's report in which he reported Laser to have a pain uh, in his chest on the left side, um, in which he reported Laser to be uh, cahectic. And um, that was on, uh, I think that was on the 8th of March. On the 10th of March, um, the, the only entry into his file was that he had, that he had died. 1956. During the time of the warm out of Khrushchev, uh, there was a, a committee of about seven or eight people. They themselves also served their sentence and they came out to our camps where we were, uh, where we were serving our sentence and each day about a hundred people were called out by this committee. And the only question they asked us, do you find yourself guilty of any crime against the Soviet Union? And we answered, no, we were not. And they knew perfectly well that we weren't to blame. We weren't, uh, we did not commit any crime against the Soviet Union. And they said, well, you are free to go now wherever you like. You can imagine how glad we were. We knew because this uh, committee came out to our camp and it took them about a month to free us all. In terms of exonerating Laser's name, I didn't really expect anything from the party, from anybody actually. The rehabilitation notice was published only in Russian in, in 1956. We had no knowledge of that at all. Perhaps at that stage, that was as far 
as the um, Soviet Communist Party could have, the Soviet Union could have gone in acknowledging they had done wrong. It was a sort of an apology. They agreed mistakes had been made, and both Laser and uh, Morris and Paul Richter had been rehabilitated. So I think that was uh, uh, some acknowledgement. Because you see, we, we started investigating this case by request of late Joslova around 87, speaking from memory again, 87, maybe early 88. And the reply which came from the relevant authorities was that, uh, and I saw some of the documents, that he was rehabilitated, he and Richter, you see, were rehabilitated as early as 1956. So it was the, immediately after the famous 20th Party Congress, where Khrushchev made this controversial report, renouncing or denouncing Stalin. It was <laughs> And where are they now? Under the ground. For what reason? For what reason? Stalin, you bastard! You bastard! Stalin! God damn it! When Stalin died in 1953, even the political prisoners cried. And they knew perfectly well that Stalin was to blame for their convictions. And uh, when he was, he had to be, uh, not buried, but there was a moment when silence <coughs> and sirens were sounded throughout the country at a special time, at a special date. And uh, the head of the uh, camps told us to get together and he'll make a little speech. Uh, I understood that Stalin was no friend of mine. And I didn't go to this meeting at all, but the majority of the political prisoners were there, even crying. That's one thing I can't understand. I can't, I simply can't understand. Being imprisoned by this Stalin, by this dictator, and yet feeling sorry for this Stalin. I think going to Perm was instructive. Uh, the first thing that strikes one is the uh, isolation of the camp. There just are fields and fields of nothing but ice and snow, and uh, in the middle of that is placed a camp. The cold, we were there in December, um, I'm not sure what the temperature was, but let's say it was round about minus 20, minus 25, it's completely unimaginable. Um, and I was warmly dressed, so I, I did keep on wondering how people who did not have adequate clothing managed to get through the winters in Siberia, particularly uh, anything on their feet. <laughs> escaped from this cave. I couldn't stay outside for very long. And I think to work, um, all I could think of at the time was the cruelty of making people work in those conditions from morning until night, um, perhaps with inadequate clothing, perhaps with very little rest and no shelter during the day. Uh, it, the hardship that that must have um, brought about is almost inconceivable for me. I, I cannot, I cannot imagine it. Um, the conditions in the camp are very stark. I think there was one fire 
to warm a room. Uh, and that was a common room. Um, waking up day after day under those conditions, it must have been intolerable. I don't know how people could, could possibly survive. Thank you.